Hey guys, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. And today's case, it takes us back to California. And before we get started, I had a couple of people ask me, and I've been thinking about this, but a lot of people have said like, you know, now they're scared to go to these places and they would like me to share my experience if I have been to some of these places. And Sequoia National Park is literally one of the, my favorite places in the entire world. I love this park. It is just so beautiful. You just feel like you're in another world. I mean, these trees are just gigantic. It's just, I love being in this park. Uh, I camped there for a few nights in a place called Crystal Springs, which is all the way down at the end of the road. I'll put a map up here, but it's a beautiful little spot. I mean, you do have to drive kind of far, but a lot of times during the summer, if you don't have a reservation, it's hard to find a campsite. My first time being there was in 2019, and I had no idea about you know the reservation system or anything, so that was the only place that was available, but I loved it, and I stayed there for almost four nights. I was three nights, and then I had to leave. This was my camp spot, and it was amazing. That night, there was this huge, loud bang and it was a sequoia tree that had came down about a quarter mile away. It shook the entire ground. I mean, it was just insane. Of course, I had to take one of these, you know, pictures with the tree, but I just wanted to share this with you because despite, you know, some bad things that can occur in these parks, they also offer a lot of wonderful experiences. And if you plan things safe and you go with other people, or at least you, you know, have a good plan, they can be a lot of fun. It's just a beautiful park with spectacular views. There's tons of wildlife. And in my opinion, at least in my experience, it didn't seem to get as crowded as some of the other parks in the area. And there's just great camping. I, I had a great time there, but unfortunately, like any other park, there are, you know, things do happen and people do go missing. And today we are gonna be talking about the disappearance of John, Jonathan Mark McNabb. And this case was a long time ago. Jonathan went missing in 1998 in february of 1998 actually so actually in order to find information about this case if you look online there's literally two or three website articles about it and it's basically the same information a couple of sentences with the same picture so i had to delve deep into some of the newspaper archives but i did find a pretty good amount of information jonathan was 28 years old at the time and actually he was unemployed at the time, but he had worked in the past uh, doing concessions at both Kings Canyon and Sequoia. So he was familiar with the area and he had just planned to go out to um, Sequoia. His friend dropped him off outside Sequoia National Park and he was just planning a 20 mile hike into the park to Lodge Pool. Jonathan is a white male. He is about 125 pounds, around 5'4". He'd probably be around 52 years old right now. He was last seen wearing a dark blue ski jacket, black Levi's jeans, and a black and black leather hiking boots. He's got brown hair and brown eyes, and he was last seen around February 7th of 1998, heading into Sequoia National Park. When he didn't make his rendezvous that Monday at Lodgepole, his friend reported him missing, and that's when the official start search got started. Now, the sheriff's volunteers and about 20 per park personnel assisted in the original search, they had people on snowmobiles coming going down one way. The main search was concentrated on the Colony Mill Road Trail. They had search dogs go out, but unfortunately there was a lot of fresh snow, which sometimes can be a, a, a positive because if the person is mobile, you know, you can maybe see footprints, but unfortunately they didn't find anything that was useful. However, they were able to bring in a helicopter from Lemoore Naval Air Search and Rescue and that helicopter was able to do a grid search on the west of the park and outside to the south too. They basically were trying to narrow down their search area because they just weren't coming up with anything inside the park. But eventually, after this failed as well, they started scaling back the search. They didn't give it up, but they started scaling it back mainly because this was winter time and more storms were moving into the area. And these search and rescue guys reported going through snow levels of five to seven feet so i mean that's that's really tough to to work in and then another search group during this time uh came up on foot from the bottom to of the low elevation areas that had no snow and tried to 
you know, conduct a search there, but unfortunately that didn't lead to anything either. So, you know, it was, these searches always start out with high hopes. And then as you go on, it, it, it does get demoralizing when you're hit with snow and, you know, you're not finding anything, but, you know, they kept at it for a couple of weeks. It is thought that Mark was going to the Lodgepool Visitor Center because apparently there's a post office or a mailbox there and he was supposed to pick up some mail. Uh, I did misspeak earlier. He's, I said, I think five four. He's five foot two, very slim. Uh, so this isn't. He's pretty, he's a pretty small guy. Uh, he was wearing a black baseball cap. I don't think I mentioned that either. And they believe that he, his route was he traveled up the Upper North Fork Road that weekend. However, it's hard to confirm any of this because they they never found any of his gear, any of his, any, nothing. Nothing's ever been found. And one ranger actually said, you know, it's plausible that he's not even in the park. I mean, it's possible that something happened in the park. Maybe he was taken out. You know, you know it's when there's no evidence, it's hard to say. And that's, that's really sad because obviously his family is still desperate for answers. This case was actually brought to my attention by a subscriber and her husband, this is her husband's cousin. So obviously like, you know, it's something that you know, they still think about and they still want answers to. And it drives me crazy when I try and look online and there's literally like two websites that have information. It's fine because I know how to find information on cases via archives and newspapers. But, you know, these people deserve more than that. You know, there should be follow up in the media on these cases. I mean, this case happened back in 1998. And really, since the case happened and the search was ongoing, after that, there really hasn't been any news coverage at all, except for a few months later, there was a remains found in one of the rivers in Sequoia. It turned out to be someone else. It wasn't Mark. Jonathan usually went by Mark, but really that's it. I mean, there's really no further information. And I understand that sometimes, hey, there's nothing really to report, but sometimes it's nice to have like a, a revamp and just, you know, tell the story again. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my channel. So what did happen to Jonathan Mark McNabb? I think it's possible that he went into the park that day. He was planning on doing just a simple 20 mile hike. Maybe he didn't have enough like snow gear. He could have fallen through an ice bridge. I mean, these are very common, especially if the weather had gotten warm after it had been cold, you know, this soft spots form. I mean, all I know is that the weather after he got into the park, lots of cold weather and lots of snow moved in. It's also plausible that if he had accidentally wandered off the main trail and was in the woods somewhere, when the snow is covering the trail, it can be very dangerous. You could you post hole, you could take one step and then fall down a couple feet, hit rocks. I mean, I learned this firsthand. It's possible he never, he got into the trail and he met with fail play. I mean, it's possible he's not even in the park anymore. Now, they did a pretty extensive search and it's been years and he was p taking a pretty direct route to a pretty popular area. Although it was winter time and there are not very many people that go into these parks during the winter time. But I mean, even so you f figure in the springtime with all these years that have passed, somebody would have found something, a hat, his shirt, something, but nothing has been found. It's just like everything vanished. Obviously animal predation is always a possibility, but that there's usually evidence of that and there would have been signs and the investigators probably would have found something they did an extensive search and they i'm sure would have found something so this really is a true mystery and i don't know it's hard to say what happened but hopefully one day somebody will find something and be able to help bring their family closure if you have any information regarding this case please call 559-565-3341 my thoughts and prayers go out to Jonathan and his family and friends and loved ones. And yeah, I'd like to dedicate this video to Jonathan Mark McNabb. Hopefully he can be brought home soon one way or another. I want to thank everybody for watching as always, and please be respectful in the comments. Thank you to co.ag for providing the background music, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey guys, thanks for sticking with me to the end. And I just wanted to say briefly about the comments. I know a lot of people every video say like you know you shouldn't hike alone that's just a death trap but i just wanted to you know throw this out there that 
There are just as many cases where people disappear when they're in groups of people and they have like five to six people and I know it's easier for us to try and disassociate from something like, you know, oh, well, we would never do that. But I challenge you to like, and I'll cover some cases where this has happened, but it's just sometimes we don't know what happens. And oftentimes it's just things that are out of our control and just fluke things. Obviously, hiking in numbers does add at an element of safety, as does, you know, proper planning, research of the place you're going to, talking to other people, knowing the weather. But I'm just throwing that out there, you know, before you leave a comment, any comment, not just these comments, but any comment in general, just think about it. That comment is worth it. You know, think about what the families and friends are going through. They're going through just an impossible situation. And, you know, a lot of the families will be seeing this and reading those comments. So I just challenge you to really put some thought in it before you comment.